Hi, everyone. Welcome to Wine.com Experiences. I'm Gwendolyn Osborne. Uh, today, we're getting a little uh, geeky and talking to three wine experts who have achieved one of the highest accreditations in wine with the title Master of Wine. Uh, thank you for everyone who submitted questions. Most of them had to do with how difficult is it to achieve this title, which we'll definitely be including in our conversation. If you purchase the wines ahead of time, excellent. Please go ahead and get those open. If you can have a separate glass for each, that's ideal. Um, and please go ahead and open all of them. You don't have to, it's not required, but um, you know, these reds especially will keep in your fridge uh, for a while. So just put the cork back in, um, put them away and the next uh, few days you can enjoy those. I can't imagine not finishing the bubbly today. So I'm not even gonna talk about that. Um, the wines we're tasting in order are the Roeder Estate L'Hermitage, the Cristiabella, I think I'm saying that right, Chianti Classico, and the Marque de Murrieta Rioja Reserva. If you downloaded a tasting map from our website, I apologize, the two reds are switched from, from what you got there. We just decided it would be better to taste them in this order. So but we will definitely be keeping you updated on what we're tasting. So now let me introduce you to our guests, our masters of wine. We have Tim Marson, who is senior buyer for California and Burgundy at wine.com. Hello, Tim. Greetings. Um, we have Bree Stock, who is Director of Wine Education at the Oregon Wine Board. Hello, Bree. Hi, Gwendolyn. Hi. And then we have Peter Marks, Partner and Vice President at Napa Valley Wine Academy. Hi, Peter. Hey, Gwendolyn. Hey, and Tim and Bree. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. We all know each other. You've got a small, tight-knit group. Um, and we've got a, a Brit and an American and Australian all representing. So I love it. Um, so for those of you who might not know exactly what it means to be a master of wine or MW, I'll start by just saying it's really difficult. Uh, it takes many years, loads of energy, um, a lot of time and a lot of perseverance. There are only 394 masters of wine in the world and about 54 right now in the US. It's definitely one of the highest achievements in wine one can possibly reach. That said, I think it's also important to talk a little bit about the difference between a master of wine and a sommelier. And um, particularly, there is a master of sommelier title. Um, so Tim, I thought maybe you could dive in with us here to talk a little bit about the difference between the master of wine and the master of sommelier and how those paths diverge. Yeah, so let's go back to what a sommelier is, because uh, certainly in this country, the word sommelier or somme has become synonymous with any kind of wine expert. Um, and it's actually a very specific uh, skilled role based in restaurants, it involves a selection and service of wine. Um, and the highest achievement as a sommelier is to become a master sommelier. Uh, and there are various steps to bec becoming that. If you're a sommelier, that makes a kind of perfectly logical uh, career path and education path. If you're not a working sommelier, uh, working sommelier um, the Wine and Spirits Education Trust, or WSET, um, is an alternate route of education. Uh, and that culminates in the WSET diploma uh, of wines and spirits. Uh, now it can be just wine. Um, and then if you successful in that, you have the option to become, uh, um, well, enter the program for the Master of Wine, which is uh, managed by the Institute of Master of Wine in London. Uh, and it's, uh, as you mentioned, it's a, a global examination uh, and it encompasses pretty much everything there is to do with wine uh, through viticulture, vinification, handling, bottling, uh, the business of wine, the distribution of wine, uh, and even kind of contemporary issues related to the wine business or the world of wine. So it's a, a all encompassing. It doesn't include any service uh, because it's more of a kind of a generalistic exam, but although it's very detailed, um, but uh, the two are, are quite distinct, both in terms of the, um, the subject matter, but also the way they're examined. So the MS is an oral examination in person, whereas the MW is a written examination, which is anonymous essentially. Um, and so it, it, it attracts different people. The, the MW specifically is testing you not just on your wine knowledge, uh, but also the application of that knowledge and the ability to communicate in writing. So um, that will appeal to, to some people more than others. Yes, absolutely. I feel like, yeah, one is, um, you know, much more on that service, hospitality, the oral, the talking, the speaking, whereas, and I did do my diploma, I just remember my hand hurting, and that's only like half of the writing that you have to do in the MW. So. I know there's a lot of that. Uh, being somebody who chose like the only major at my college that had a thesis, I, that's why I went that path. Um, but yeah, those are, those are very different and a good distinction. Um, Peter, I wanted to talk to you because you were the only, the 10th MW in the US 
back in 1995. And you were also one of the MWs who taught me for my diploma, I remember my instructors, uh, some 12 or 13 years ago now. Uh, can you tell me back then what drew you to the MW program? There weren't a lot of them. It wasn't highly acknowledged or I guess known. What, what was the impetus to join? Well, I, I really had no idea when I started. Uh, I think what made me aware of the MW program was uh, one of the first two Americans who passed in 1990 was Joel Butler, along with Tim Hanai. And I knew, I knew Joel and I ran into him at, at a tasting right after he passed. And I said, what's the master of wine? Then he sent me a copy of the exam and I looked at it and I thought, what the heck? <laughs> uh, but then a couple of years later, they, the Institute of Masters of Wine offered their very first education seminar in the U.S. And sort of on a whim, I applied thinking I wouldn't get in, but little did I know they, I think they would take anybody who paid the fees for the first time. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I, I embarked on that program. And I think anybody who's into wine realizes that the more you, you know, the more you want to know. And I I enjoyed just learning. It was really fun. Oh, of course, when you get into the heart of studying for the MW, there's days when you just want to throw in the towel. But for the most part, learning is enjoyable and it makes you appreciate uh, what you're doing. And I was in the wine business. I worked in a re great retail shop and I really wanted to improve my, you know, my career path. And that definitely was uh, something that the MW helped with. And what was the most challenging part of the exam for you? Um, the theory was a little bit more challenging, so it took me three attempts. I passed the tasting on my first attempt, fortunately, um, but it took a little bit more just, uh, you know, there are, as Tim alluded to, there's five different papers. And for me, um, being in the business, you forget about other aspects of, you know, not just retail. There's the production, there's the distrib distribution, the, the handling, all of that. So I, re I really had to study from the business side. I took a marketing class to kind of help me out there. Um, but I finally got over the, over the hump, so to speak. Good. And it, it is all encompassing. Um, mm -hmm. And Bree, I know you had worked in restaurants before this, just kind of going back to what Tim was talking about. Why did you choose the MW path over the MS path? You know, to be honest, I really hated getting those foil cuts on my fingers and <laughs> it's worse than a paper cut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, ki <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, really, it was about accessibility. I was working in fine dining in Vancouver, British Columbia at the time, and there was very uh, little interaction from any of the sommelier uh, associations. And uh, the WSET was um, very engaged in the market there. And I was fortunate enough to also uh, work with, uh, in my restaurant, Canada's first female master of wine, Barbara Phillip. And she was a fantastic mentor. And, and to Tim's point, the anonymity of the Master of Wine program was very appealing uh, and also the visibility of women in, in the program as well. Um, we have certainly a much higher number of women uh, that are Masters of Wine than the sommelier community. Uh, so I think that was really important uh, perspective as well. And then also to Peter's point, I was just very curious. And once you start learning, you start asking why. And so I ended up in cellars and vineyards and, you know, I'm an Aussie and we like to travel as well. So it, it was the perfect, perfect recipe for me to follow this path or rabbit hole around the wine world. Yeah. Well, obviously one thing that you're all good at is tasting. And so that is what we're here to do today. We are starting with the Roeder L'Hermitage, um, Roeder State L'Hermitage. So Roeder State is the California property for Champagne House Louis Roeder, and it's located in the Anderson Valley of Mendocino. Um, Tim, I, I know that you have had the opportunity to taste many vintages of this wine. It's a beautiful place, beautiful property. What do you, what stands out to you about this particular producer in making champagne, um, sparkling wine? Yeah, so uh, a couple of years ago, I had the opportunity to taste uh, this particular wine uh, in a vertical tasting, what we call a vertical tasting, so multiple vintages of the same wine. Um, back to the, the first vintage they produced at the L'Hermitage Cuvée, which was 1989. Uh, the property was purchased in the early 80s uh, by the Rousseau family, uh, who ran Louis Roeder and still do, uh, in Champagne. And they were looking for uh, a part of California that was perfectly suited to making high quality sparkling wine. And uh, inevitably, they looked at places like Carneros, um, Domé Chandon, and uh, Mom Napa were already in place there. The other two Champagne houses that invested in, in California, Northern California. Uh, and they decided that Anderson Valley up in Mendocino 
uh, was the perfect place for them to make the kind of sparkling wine they wanted to. So um, the, the important thing about that area, of course, that it was a cool climate area, um, the proximity to the very cold Pacific Ocean nearby the Mendocino coast uh, meant you had this cooling effect, particularly uh, at nighttime, a sharp drop in temperature was also fog influence. Uh, and that kind of helps to kind of temper, uh, temper what is otherwise kind of a relatively warm region. Certainly kind of the, the southeast end of the valley is quite, quite warm, but then you get into the, what they call the deep end uh, towards the, the Mendocino coast and it's uh, really rather chilly. And, and that was perfect because for sparkling wine, you're looking for wines that are naturally high in acidity to give you that structure and balance in the wine once it goes through the, the, the secondary fermentation in the bottle. So they invested enormously in the region it's, and it's paid dividends because they are uh, one of the finest sparkling wine producers in the new world. And the Lemitage Cuvée um, uh, is, is their kind of exceptional cuvee, not made every year. Um, and it spends uh, up to six years on its yeast leads in the bottle, which gives it a tremendous richness and verve uh, and texture and complexity. Um, and the other key thing here is that they're using a proportion of reserve wines, which is a technique they use in Champagne. So they use it for all their wines, but for this particular wine, it's a 4% of a reserve wine. Uh, I believe this vintage is based on Chardonnay, um, and that's aged in large old uh, French casks. And that gives uh, a backbone and a complexity and a richness to this wine that, uh, that is quite kind of definitive and, and, and unique leading to this property. And it's also, to my mind, one of the best uh, value, high quality sparkling wines produced anywhere outside of Champagne. And the, the tasting I mentioned a couple of years ago show that it's a, a, a long lasting wine capable of, of a great ageability, which is which is rare outside Champagne. Yeah. Oh, okay. That means we really have to taste it because I'm very. <laughs> <laughs> so as we, as we were talking about, it, I'm like, okay, can we drink now? Um, so I want to taste it. And as you taste, can you, I want you, kind of you to talk through a little bit about how you assess it. So, you know, you're looking at a wine and let's say you're looking at sparkling wine, you look at the bubbles. What, what do those bubbles tell you? Um, do you swirl a sparkling wine? What about a couple of those yeah, things? So, uh, sparkling wine can tell a lot from, from its appearance. Um, obviously they're, they're bubbles, hopefully, sitting in the glass. Uh, in this particular glass, you can't see many left, but that's uh, just maybe because I wash it too much. Um, so what you can tell from the bubbles is that the, the style of, of secondary fermentation may have gone to. So, through, so a traditional method or champagne method, sparkling wine, you'll see a kind of steady stream of very small bubbles, uh, of what they call a fine mousse. Um, with a Prosecco, you might see more of a kind of frothy, energetic mousse with kind of larger bubbles and uh, a kind of creamy kind of top to the wine, almost like you poured a soda. Um, and then also from, from the color, you can tell something about the age of the wine, uh, you can tell something from the perhaps from the grape varieties used, and also the way it was made. If there was, uh, if the primary fermentation happened in oak, for example, they might expect a, a deeper colour. So there's a lot you can tell from from just looking at it, even before you stick your nose in. And in terms of, of glassware, um, I'm using a, a Zofenwald stem from Austria, which is a hand blown uh, producer of very high quality glass uh, stemware. And uh, what I like about this is that you have. The, uh, that kind of diagonal shape allows you to kind of appreciate the aromas. What you normally do is you look at the wine first before you swirl it because of the things I mentioned, particularly the mousse will disappear once you start swirling it. Um, but this concentrates the aromas into the top of the glass. So you can appreciate the, the bead or the mousse, the wine from this uh, relatively narrow. Uh, like that the narrow cone shape at the bottom too allows the mousse to come out because sometimes you don't see that. Anyway. Exactly. Um, and with a bit of swirl, you can enjoy, especially for an, uh, a, a, a rich, complex sparkling wine like this, you wouldn't use this for a, a, a kind of entry level Prosecco because there's, there's no point because there's not much concentrational structure there. Um, but for a, a, a serious sparkling wine like this, uh, a, a glass with a bigger bowl is, is very appropriate. So in terms of aromas, um, what you're looking for really is, the key word is autolysis. Uh, which is the uh, interaction of the wine with the dead yeast cells in the, in the, in, in the bottle or the tank. You're going to get far more of that in a traditional method wine that's aged, and the longer it's aged, the, the more you're going to smell that. And what, is, what does autophysis smell like? It's essentially kind of crushed biscuit or uh, fresh dough or, or even kind of, kind of coffee bean or roasted, roasted coffee bean in, in, in aged examples. Um, so that toastiness, that, that breadiness, is a, is a key clue to how the wine was made. And then you look into 
kind of uh, fruit flavors and what that might tell you about the, the, the grape varieties involved. This one's actually a, pretty much a 50-50 blend between Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, the two main grapes of Champagne. Um, I find it very difficult to tell blind whether a, a wine is more Pinot or more Chardonnay because yeah. there's so many other variables involved, it's difficult to determine which. From a simple, simple point of view, Chardonnay you might find a bit more kind of green apple and creamy note and more kind of uh, white flower elements. Uh, and then with a Pinot Noir you might find a little bit of red fruit inevitably given us a red variety, um, and a little bit more backbone and structure and more kind of um, mid-weight kind of um, richness. Yeah. And then on the palate, you're looking again at the, the texture and the, and the finesse of the mousse, the kind of the, the size of the bubbles is important here. With a Prosecco or a Charmat method style sparkling, the flavors will dissipate very quickly. The mousse will kind of be very kind of creamy and mouthfilling initially, but it will fade very rapidly. With a high quality uh, traditional method of wine like this, you get that uh, focus and persistence of the flavors and the mousse right to the back palate. And this, and this wine, a tremendous uh, acid freshness that gives balance to the wine, because there is a, a kind of a ripe fruit flavor, a little bit more generous than you might find in the champagne, for example. But then you have that underlay of the, the reserve wine uh, and the, the, the five years or six years on, on, the, on the lees, which gives it that bready richness and that toastiness and that kind of mouth-filling um, texture and, and dynamism. And the finish on this is just, it's still going. I just, I love that finish because it's just very well balanced and just keeps lingering on. And then you need another sip, so it's... it's yeah, <laughs> it's very Moorish. Um, when I, when I first started uh, judging what wine competitions and I was judging a fight of sparkling wine, I was found it very difficult when you're tasting blind a lot of wines to kind of distinguish where the highs and lows, because you have the bubbles in the way uh, impacting your impression of the wine. So uh, uh, MW at that time kind of advised me to kind of focus on the on the finish of the wine, the lingering flavors in the glass. What is the quality of the base wine there? And you can tell that from how the wine leaves leaves the palate the flavors, the concentration, the complexity there. Uh, and in this wine, you can see there's a very high quality base wine um, and also one that's gonna give capacity to age because it has that, that structure uh, and the acidic, acidic backbone uh, and those already kind of emerging kind of non-primary fruit, fruit flavors coming through. Okay. And, that's, and as it ages, you're gonna get more of that non-primary fruit. You'll get more of the biscuit and the toast and the roasted nuts and things like that as they, they come through, right? Yeah, and uh, what was great about the tasting I did, as I mentioned, earlier is that as this wine ages you get more the kind of honey and the caramel and the butterscotch notes coming through kind of a uh, kind of a dried nut or roasted even a roasted nut character coming through um and it's fascinating to watch it evolve at age as it ages because to my mind it reminded me of um, mature champagne um which was kind of indicative of, of what a high quality wine this is and i often like to refer to it as the, the cristal of california probably because of the rotor link but it, it <laughs> fraction of the price of Cristal, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic wine. There you go. Brie, what did you, what is your take on this? Just a couple words about what you thought. A, the, the freshness and the energy that is really in this wine for how much concentration and power and complexity it has is very impressive to me. And I love that creaminess on the palate from the extended lees. It really it is really very, very seductive. But then that acid comes through and washes your palate through. And it's just, I need another mouthful. <laughs> exactly. it's, it's got that beautiful balance and complexity. Peter, what about you? I know this is one of your favorites, one of your wife's favorites too. Oh, yes. Uh, we love going up to Anderson Valley. And yeah, I mean, it, Bree and Tim have said it already, but it's, to me, the wine is seamless. I mean, it's just perfectly put together. It's just a joy to drink. Um, and, you know, and Tim's talked about you know, how you figure out where this is from. And maybe it has a slightly tiny bit more ripe fruit than you might find in Champagne. But I can tell you, we've put in the non-vintage Rotor Estate Brut in MW exams and in education seminars. And more often than not, students put it in Champagne. It's okay. that good. I mean, this is a fabulous wine. Yes, we're big fans of Rotor, both the non-vintage and, of course, the, the yeah. Lermitage. Um, yeah. So we're going to move on. We're moving into Chianti with the... Um, so 
and Bree, you're going to correct me on that, I'm sure. But um, so this is a very <laughs> classic wine of, of Tuscany winery in Tuscany. And Bree, I know you worked harvest there. Um, tell me how to pronounce it. Corchibella. I I say Corchibella. Corchibella. Okay. <laughs> you just say Bella. Everything's going to be okay. But um, exactly, exactly. Right. It rolls off the tongue. <laughs> so. So this is a beautiful place um, in, in Chianti Classico. I think it's, um, you know, Stunning Hills, very classic of what it does. I know they farm organically and biodynamically and um, just have some really passionate people working there, crafting these wines. Um, so I wanna, I wanna taste through through the wine a little bit. So where are they situated right in Chianti Classico, correct? They are the, you know, as most uh, Classico references, when you see that in Italy, uh, they're, their entire um, production is centered in that heart of the traditional historical heart of the Chianti village. And they actually have three vineyards in um, four of, in three of the regions, four, in three of the four regions of Chianti. Um, so they have a really great spread of sites in terms of aspect and different elevations and different soil types and different clones of Sangiovese. So, uh, I feel like this is, for me, the most complete representation of Chianti Classico and Sangiovese um, that, that often comes out of, of the Chianti region. Uh, and every year I find that, you know, there's a hundred, you know, hundred thousand bottles made of this wine. It's a, it's a, you know, a lot of wine that's made, but it is so distinctively Chianti Classico. And, you know, to your point as well, Gwendolyn, about the farming, I really think it comes back to the fact that they are the largest biodynamic farmer producer in Italy. Uh, Alessandro, the viticulturist or agronomist, um, has been there for nearly two decades and is very, very thoughtful. And then Manfred Ng, the winemaker, really employs that same uh, thoughtful approach to each parcel that comes in and it's a lot of micro vinifications and so you actually think that you know harvest is is intense and short but in Crocebella it actually spans almost seven weeks and so it's a very long harvest and you're just constantly you know, doing micro vinifications in one, two, five ton fermenters uh, and really gently coaxing the, the vintage and the place out of, out of the Sangiovese grapes. Oh, wow. Okay. So I want to, let's taste through this and kind of your method of tasting. Um, you know, first, you know, we were looking at the, the color, um, you know, this is 2016 vintage. So I know you're still saying, how, how do you assess a color? Tell us how to, the red wine <laughs> color trick. <laughs> yeah, so the, you know, red wine, when you're looking at it, you're looking at a concentration of color um, and how much concentration is held from the core of the glass to the rim. Uh, and you're looking for vibrancy of color. If uh, the wine is ruby or purple in hue, that's indicating to me that it's a fairly young wine. Um, if there's some bricking or tawny colors that are moving towards the edges, that probably tells me that that wine is beginning to to take on some um, bottle age characters and possibly has some extended time in oak as well. And so this wine for me, while it's 2016, it's still very uh, vibrant and is, is pushing to ruby all the way to the edge. Uh, and typical of the Sangiovese grape, it's not incredibly thick skinned. So you can you know, see some bright um, cherry light patches coming through as well. Yeah, it's very pretty. Um... So I want to I want to get talking about the aromas and the nose um, as we give it a squirrel, swirl and just kind of what you're getting from it. And then as we taste the wine, I want you to kind of also as we're tasting it and you're going through it, talk a little bit about what kind of you find in the wine that speaks to the hallmark characteristics of a Chianti Classico because that's what I think this represents. So, all right, aromas, let's go. Great. Aromas, I mean, this for me is a fairly pronounced intensity wine. It's vibrant in its fruit profile, but it also has some distinctive uh, Chianti and Sangiovese characters, which is that sort of piney cedar forest character. Um, you know, the, the um, 
incense or cedar pines uh, and then also some really lovely tea leaf characters um, and a nice vibrant red fruit profile as well which for me is a hallmark of of Sangiovese. It's a very pretty wine, um, but it can also have some um, bloody sanguine notes as well, which for me, I find really appealing for a food and wine pairing. <laughs> and, and Sangiovese means blood of Jove, which is... Blood of Jove, yes, exactly. <laughs> so... Yeah, in addition to, I'm getting just a hint of oak, but it's yeah. very, very uh, gentle approach. Um, so the fruit profile is really coming through there. And then I get a really lovely um, sort of gravelly, um, chalky, chalky, uh, tannin profile as well, which I think, um, you know, true Chianti Classico has a sort of a minerality and freshness to it that, that sort of supports the fruit profile there. Yeah, I like the, there's a, the floral, the little hint of floral that's coming through. Either. Yeah, that sort of tea leaf and rose right, exactly. character. So crushed violet, yeah, something along yeah, those Yeah, crushed violet, but, yeah, um, very floral. But very exuberant wine and really, really... Lots going on, just, which I yeah. love. Right, okay, so let's taste it. And this is Sangiovese. That mm -hmm. freshness is just so textbook Sangiovese. Medium bodied, um, you know, vibrant fruit. But this is an energetic wine, you know. It's really making me salivate. It's really bringing in some of those savory components, some of that sanguine, meaty nature. But there's also that tension on the palate that feels like, cool wet stones to me and I always think of good Chianti Classico as being powerful but very tense and very elegant at the same time almost like you know a, a, the way that a ballerina is structured and powerful and muscular <laughs> but very graceful and so for me that's what always true high quality Sangiovese and Chianti Classico looks like to me and you can feel that tea leaf tannin and gravelly tannins, which are a reflection of the soils of, you know, Greve um, and, and the crumbly um, soils, uh, Galestro soils that really penetrate, the roots penetrate through uh, in, in this appellation as well. Mm -hmm. And this is only four years old. How would you know how much longer this could last? What stands out to you in that, the balance or? When I'm looking for length and quality, it's really about the concentration and complexity, but also um, about the elegance of that. You know, nothing is out of place. Everything is very harmonious and together. There's high acidity and there's, you know, medium plus tannins here, but they're all seamless together and it lingers for a very long time. And there's a freshness to the fruit profile here. It's not a baked or jammy or desiccated fruit profile. It's very, very fresh. Um, and everything that all of the structural components in this wine really support that fruit profile and that freshness. And so for me, I think this wine is a baby and is probably going to age for, I mean, it's going to continue to get better for at least 10 years without doubt. Um, and the 2016 vintage in particular, it was one of those vintages that, was actually quite extended and so it wasn't overly hot um, and wasn't overly ripe and so the the grapes really got to hang out on the vine and ripen quite you know calmly and so it was a long harvest but everything came in in the greatest condition um, and and really pure fruit flavors it's very pure that's a great word for this it is just very very pure um tim what are your thoughts on that the wine this wine's delicious uh, Vibrancy and elegance are kind of two words that kind of sum this up very nicely. And uh, your description was fantastic. Uh, Sangiovese, San because I often struggle to identify what those things I recognize as Sangiovese, but I can't kind of pin words on them. And especially that kind of that piney note, which I often kind of associate with kind of oregano or kind of certain types of herbs. Um, but as soon as you pop the cork on this, it bursts from the glass with this kind of juicy, sour red cherry thing uh, and that kind of vibrant piney herb of purple notes. Um, but then the other thing on the palate, the, uh, the finesse, the, the juicy acidity, and that kind of minerality to the tannins uh, was, was really distinctive and uh, would take you, take you straight to Chianti Classico. And I think it's a, 
a beautiful expression of, of a very refined stuff. Yeah. Peter, what about you? Any thoughts on that? Uh, agree. Ditto? Ditto? <laughs> yeah, and, you know, <laughs> and you use the word purity because I think that is really what sums up this wine because to me, um, it shows the true essence of San Giovese um, in a very pure form. You know, there are a lot of Chianti, Chianti Classicos that tend to be, um, let's call it a little more rustic, you know, maybe a little volatile acidity, maybe a little bread. And then the other end, you have the modern, you know, ri riper fruit, um, lots of oak. This one is right in the middle. I mean, it's extremely well made. It's got, there's no, you know, volatile notes at all. And it's just beautifully balanced. And, you know, you talk about the acidity. I thought the, the sparking wine had acidity. I'm still mouthwatering from this. This is amazing. <laughs> I'm ready yeah, to eat something. It's very good. And I like what you also said about the elegance and power, because I also think that that comes a little bit together with the food you pair this with. Because um, I think that kind of a lot of some, not all, Italian foods, um, especially in, uh, you know, when you're putting pasta together with a meat and a tomato sauce, you kind of have this elegant acidity, but then that heavier portion and just kind of all about balance. So. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, so Sebastiano, the, the owner is, uh, is, is vegan and, you know, Alessandro, the agronomist, is, grows a lot of the food on site as well, the vegetables on site. And to have this wine with, you know, lovely roasted, fresh roasted garden vegetables, yeah. zucchini, yeah. tomatoes and all of the herbs, it's just the perfect, you know, partner for, for that fresh spring and summer dishes. That's beautiful. Okay, now we're gonna to move to Rioja. Thank you, Brie. Um, so uh, Peter, we're going into Marque de Murieta Rioja Reserva, which is an hey. iconic uh, family owned winery over 150 years old, um, made by counts and other royal people, <laughs> which is quite often the case in Europe, but um, it's situated in the Rioja Alta region and it's just had some amazing lasting power with some really classic, amazing wines. Um, so, so Peter, I know Rioja can sometimes be a challenging region to understand because so many, so much of the labeling and regulations revolve around aging. Um, this particular wine is Reserva. Can you, what does Reserva mean from an aging perspective? So there are some uh, aging uh, classifications for Rioja, and basically, if it's a Reserva, it must be aged at least three years before it's sold. Uh, one of that year must be in in some type of cask. Of, 225 liter cask and six months in the bottles yeah, there you go. Uh, in addition to all that. And so that, and this wine was actually aged 18 months in American oak. And you see there some old, you know, wooden casks, which are very traditional nowadays. Uh, this winery, by the way, you mentioned it's one of the oldest wineries. This was the first commercial winery in oh. Rioja in 1852. Um, wow. And they, the longest living as far as I know. So this is a, a kind of a treat to taste this. Yeah. Um, that's great. Um, so, so let us taste it because I kind of want to talk about how this this wine represents Rioja and that style of Reserva and the age. Yeah. Um, but starting with the color, because um, you know a lot of times you know, we're getting a wine that's already been aged a little bit, whereas a lot of wines usually come out immediately. Um, right. But we're looking at something that comes out a little bit after some age. So, um, tell us about the color here and how that might. Yeah, I mean, I I'll but... tell you one of the things that's really hard about Riojas is trying to guess the age. I mean, Tempranillo, which is the main grape that's uh, used in this wine, is almost impervious to age, even though it's not a grape that tends to have a lot of uh, acidity or a lot of tannin. Um, it's not a very thick, I mean, it's moderately thick skin, so it's not like a Cabernet or other grapes that you might think would age really, really long. And for some reason, it, re it resists oxidation. And so even though this wine is a 2015, um, it looks very bright, ruby, very youthful to me, and sort of medium, between medium and deep in intensity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, um, you know, that is something I know Tempranillo loves oak and it does really well with oak, which I think you know, is why. It does, yeah, it, in the can, you know, Tempranillo can soak up oak too much if you're not uh, too careful. In fact, back in the, when I first got into wine and selling wine uh, back in the 80s, a um, long time ago, you know, it was a lot of those wines were aged in oak for so long and it tasted more of oak than it did wine. But starting in the 1990s, they began to sort of cut back on the oak. Also using uh, many producers nowadays use more French oak, which is, which is slightly more subtle. But even this wine, which is all American oak, is not overpowered by the oak at all. And I yeah, think well, people are really yeah. allow the grape to come through. Yeah, let's get into that with the aromas and what, what's kind of coming through that tells yeah, us. Yeah, um, so I'm getting beautiful. I mean, the first impression, 
just having tasted Chianti, it's a little bit warmer climate, even though uh, we're in the Rioja, um, and this is a cooler part. Rioja Alta is a slightly cooler part. There's also Rio, Rioja Alavesa, which is a little bit cooler. And then you have Rioja uh, Oriental, uh, formerly known as Rioja Baja, which is much warmer. But there's, again, there's some freshness to this wine because of that slightly higher altitude. They're about a thousand feet elevation, give or take, uh, for these vineyards. And there are also some bright floral, red fruit, strawberries, uh, Bing cherry, plum. And then with Tempranillo, there's always a spicy note. I, I get like a little bit of um, pepper and licorice, maybe. The licorice. So like yeah. And yeah. as I mentioned it, and the slight, you know, it can be a little herbal too. So there's probably some fresh herbs. But there's more, yeah, they're more fresh. They're not kind of dry. They're more like. Not fresh. at all. Not dry. No, no, yeah. very fresh. Yeah. And this has got, uh, as I mentioned, a little bit of oak. I, I do pick up a little vanilla, maybe a hint of dill weed. There's that herb, you know, American oak can often taste of coconut, vanilla, and dill. And those are the things, but not overpowering at all. The, the fruit is more prominent than anything. Mm. Wow. This has got great body, nice and full, rich. Um, but again, balance, it's got some really good acidity. They, they blend in some other grapes. This is 80% Tempranillo, 12% uh, Graciano, uh, I think 6% uh, Mazuela, which is Carignan, and then only 2% Garnacha or Grenache. And the Mazuelo and the uh, Graciano are both grapes that give you really good structure in the sense of tannin and acidity. Oh. And so this wine has got a really nice balance to it. And I'm again, I'm mouthwatering like I have with the other two wines. Um, one thing I would love for you to talk a little bit too, just because I think that sometimes people um, just having taught wines before uh, get confused about where tannin versus acidity mm -hmm. goes and comes. Could you kind of speak a little bit to that of where you might- I still get confused. <laughs> I know you can, I've heard you do yeah. it. So the easiest thing is to think about where you taste those elements mm -hmm. uh, on your palate. And generally um, the way I taste tannin is more up in the roof of my mouth or my gums. And it is a drying sensation. Uh, you know, think about if you eat a green banana or if you overbrew a cup of tea or worse, if you chew an aspirin, those are <laughs> evidence of tannin. Whereas acid to me, now you can feel it on your tongue, but I look to acid as a expression of how much saliva is formed. So it's a mouthwatering effect. And it always takes, I always taste tannin first. I, I swirl it around and see, okay, what's the tannin? I spit it out and then I wait about 10 seconds. And sometimes I'll drop my jaw down like this too, because that will accentuate the flow of the um, saliva. And then I, I wait, for me, it's about a 10 second delay until the saliva kicks in. Yeah. Yeah, no, it is kind of, I kind of started to talk about it. It's like one sucks all the saliva away and the other produces it. So yeah, just, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's and not like this it's the yin and yang. It's a perfect yes, balance. It is. Yeah. And that's why you want a balance with it. You would like to yeah, have. That's what makes a great balance wine. Right. 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 Yeah, thank you. There's also a bit of a, a little bit of a new leather in this wine, which I often find with uh, Rioja. Um, and that could be the temper. I think that's the Tempranillo. And as it ages, it'll become more old leather. But right now it's sort of like, Prada or MS, you know, it's got some really high-end <laughs> leather going on right here. I'll tell you, it's a good one. Like they're just going to become saddle or like, yeah, yeah. Those, now they tend to get more um, leathery, but older leather, um, like it's still like a really nice high quality purse. And then you get some, um, I get some brown mushroom, maybe a little cocoa uh, with, with bottle age. And that, you know, again, these wines can age amazingly well. And don't tell everybody this, but these are the best bargains in the yeah. world of wine, seriously. I mean, you can get a great Rioja Reserva, which is like this one. I don't have the price on top of my head, but it, you know, most of these are under $20 a bottle. And you think about a wine that's already been aged th three plus years and is, is made with ageability. This wine will go 10 to 20 years if you like to drink them a little more of that bottled age. Um, it's, a, it's a great value. Yeah, they are. I think this one's around the 25, but again, it's that super high, mm -hmm. high quality. Yeah. And then um, yeah, I was going to say of one of my questions is going to be, you know, uh, the idea of aging wine, a lot of Rio has already pre-aged when you right. get it. So kind of understanding how, how long, I think I guess it depends kind of on what kind of characteristics you like in a wine too, yeah. right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And most That's people right. today are making these wines a little bit fresher than they have in the past. Um, you know, the color indicates that right away, but you know, in the old days, like I said, when I started, you know, you pick up a Reserva and it would already be pretty tawny colored and the oak again would be really prominent, but um, 
allowing the fruit to come through. And again, the elegance of this wine is amazing. When you think about Rioja, a lot of people think it's a really hot climate, but there's freshness, there's vibrancy in this wine. Yeah, and I think both the Sangiovese, the, the Chianti Classico, and, and this Reserva have kind of really showcased the classic style that is now available. I feel like, just like you said, some of those Sangioveses or Chiantis, you could get too much, you know, earth and bread, or it's too acidity, or it's just not balanced, or too tart. A lot of times yeah. um, you would get that, or the um, Rioja would sometimes just be so oxidized, not that Tempranillo took to that, but it would just get too much of that. And I feel like these are so pretty and, and pure. Yeah. Um, um, Tim, what are your thoughts on this wine? It's funny because um, when I was studying BMW, I often used to confuse Rioja and Chianti when I was tasting it blind. And obviously I feel stupid now because I'm tasting these <laughs> markedly <laughs> different. But uh, Rioja and uh, Tempranillo can, especially in the kind of cooler parts of Rioja, have this great natural acidity. And you associate that with Sangiovese and you have to really focus on the kind of Italian profile between these two. And then there's more kind of uh, complex flavors. Is it more kind of herbal and piney? Is it more kind of leathery and vanillary? Um, but I think this is, is a classic example of a, of a great Rioja, um, really a benchmark style. Um, and it's a great lesson in how to use new oak well, uh, because there is on paper plenty of new oak, but it's so beautifully um, melded with the fruit um, and the structure that you don't notice at all. It's a, a very kind of seamless whole. It's going to triumph of, of winemaking in many ways. Uh, and that's what good, good Rioja is. Yeah, Bree, what about you? Yeah, I'm, I'm really impressed by its freshness and just how youthful. I mean, this is a wine that is powerful and ripe and compact and all of that new oak. But it is just, it feels to me like it's just a baby. And there is just, it, it's, you know, voluminous in your mouth, you know, it just keeps coming and coming. And um, I just think this wine has a ways to go. It really needs food with it, I think. It does. What food would you put with it? Anyone? Oh, I would probably go for something fun like a paella or some great yeah. ham on some fatty bits to break through some of that tannin at the moment. Yeah, I think a good paella with some spice, something with a little spice, with something with a little. Um, yeah, that paprika and red pepper and yeah, yeah, tomatoes. Yeah, perfect. Right. No, I think I think all three of these wines are are just wonderful in showcasing a sense of place. Um, and a sense of that, that classic style. So I appreciate you all going through them and talking about them. Um, I'm gonna end with just a couple of questions that came through from people. Um, one was just, if you're looking for a certification, uh, just to start out on, I, kinda, I think we kind of covered that a little bit of like if you're going in hospitality, the sommelier route is good. If you want to go into more of the business and marketing, then the WSET route is good. Um, but if you had to take that one class, uh, what would you choose? And then the second one was, do you have like a book that sits behind you that whenever you're stumped and need a question, you grab? Maybe two books, I'll give you two books. But, okay, so Brie, we'll start with you. A certification, do you, you know, WCT level two, one, BSW, what? Yeah, I, I think WSCT level two is, is such a great all round certification. And it does teach you some service techniques and it food does. preparing. And yeah, so I, I think that is an all round and I think it's fantastic for the consumer level or if you're wanting to maybe explore into going into the wine industry, whether that be a tasting room position in a wine region um, or a retail, you know, I, I think that the WSCT because it teaches you quality and gives you context in a global perspective. So quality and price ratios, for me, that's, it's my gold standard. Okay. Tim, I imagine you're, oh, in the book, what book do you have? Do you have oh, a book? I'm so a hard. bit of a Jancis addict, so oh, I, I do, <laughs> I do. I'm, I'm the same way, like, if I had to go to, it's the Oxford. Yeah, the, the Oxford, and then I love the Wine Grapes Bible that's done by her and Julia Harding, and oh, uh, it's, yeah, fantastic. That's also, that's also Jancis, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Jancis is another master of wine for those who might not know. Um, so Tim, what about you? Are you, uh, any accreditation recommendations or you think, are you well, I went the e route, uh, initially and, and continued with that into the, into the MW and, and that, that made sense for me. I, I went straight out of university into, into the wine industry. I was lucky because being in England, we could taste and drink wines legally, 
uh, as students. So I was uh, had a good fortune of tasting some great wine before some of the people of my age in this country were legally able to, to do so. So I had a bit of a head start in that sense, but I went straight into the wine business and and, and followed the WST route because that made sense to me because I wasn't a sommelier uh, and I wasn't interested in working in the, in the restaurant industry at that time. So uh, that's kind of the best all around approach as, as Bree said, and I'm sure people will agree with that. In terms of, um, it's tricky. I mean, everything is so online now. Obviously when I was studying many years ago, um, I had to rely on, on books, printed books and, and, and heavy, heavy uh, additions to my bookcase, but uh, so much material is available online now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, I don't want to mention Janet again, but her, her website is a, a great resource of, uh, of material and, and news and uh, up-to-date uh, facts and figures. So um, that's, if you're getting into wine, that's a great thing to check out uh, because uh, you can explore many different parts of the wine business and, and, get, and get access to great tasting notes and maps. Yeah. And, are those are those called the purple pages? Am I, purple pages, exactly. Purple pages. Yeah. Okay, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, yes, yes. So, Janssen Tams. Um, so, Peter, um, you are run a school, so I feel like you're be like you should come to Napa. WSCT. There's nothing else. No, that's else. obviously <laughs> I said. WC, but you know, if, if you don't have WCT available in your area, it is available in many places online. Yeah. But you know, go to a local you know community college, take a class, yeah. and don't forget you can learn on your own. I mean, when I started, there was no WCT in America, and I learned by just tasting. And tasting is critical no matter what route you take, whether it's you know master sommelier or master wine. And you can you know take a wine, look up the, look up the region, talk about you know read the background and how it's made, and just learn to become comfortable with that wine, maybe focus on a certain region or type of grape variety for a while. So you really come to understand that. And I think yeah. that's something that um, goes hand in hand with whatever type of uh, course you may be right. taking. And for books, I see wine grapes behind you. Yeah, yeah, and, and Oxford, <laughs> Oxford Companion, which I'm not sure if Tim mentioned, but if you do yeah, have Oxford. Jancis Robinson's um, website, you get access to that. And then the other one, again, let's give Jancis a big plug today, but the World Atlas of of wine. Yeah, well, that was great too. That yeah, is great, like especially Oxford. with the maps. Love, the maps are amazing. Dictionary, it's like an encyclopedia, and I love that. You know, that yeah. just is a great thing. But um, also, you know, for those of you studying at home, you can always check out wine.com while you're tasting a wine, and you can look it up, and we'll give you the tasting notes and the critic reviews and a map and uh, information about the winery and the region and the rate. So feel free to use that as reference. Uh, we would love for you to do that. Uh, for those of you here uh, watching at home, thank you so much for joining us. If you didn't get a chance to taste these wines, I'm sure you want to now. The trio is still available on wine.com. Um, and of course, this video will live on our wine.com YouTube channel. So you can go through the tasting once more with us. Uh, for Tim, Peter, and Bree, thank you so much for your time and expertise and joining us uh, today. Um, it was just, you know, it's wonderful to learn more. I feel like we're always learning and it's always more fun to learn together. So uh, thank you so much for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of these lines tonight, rest of the weekend, however you choose to do it. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank Cheers. you. It's both a science and a form of high art. It's made from the combination of grapes, sunlight, rain, soil, and time. It's raised up in the moments that matter. It's wine. And we are wine.com. We have the largest wine selection in the world, online sommeliers with free advice. And now, our powerful new app puts the entire world of wine in your hands. Wine.com. Seriously passionate about wine. Download our free app today.